So our next speaker uh, is the amazing uh, Linda Gray, uh, who has built an uh, amazing CSF League program at Duke. Uh, of course, it's not just her, right? We've heard from uh, Peter Kranz, uh, two other neuroradiologists, neurosurgeons. Um, so it's going to be uh, fantastic to hear her talk about uh, percutaneous adventures in SIH treatment. Thank you, Linda. Well, you know what I am super excited about is how many people are now involved in thinking about this problem, which is a huge problem. And I think this room seems more crowded than last year. Um, I'm guessing because there's a really smaller room. I was thinking there were just more people here. <laughs> Well, um, as uh, Vauder said, um, I am gratefully joined by Peter Krantz and then Tim Amrine and Mike Malinzak. We also have two physician's assistants who work with us, Hope, who's here, and Jeff Taylor. And then we have a whole office of four people who actually help us schedule and look at the images and go through all the you know, information that we get about these patients. We see about somewhere between four and 500 patients a year. And, um, and that does not include all the repeats that come back, hopefully not too many, but yeah. So it's super busy, so we see people five days a week. We have a CT fluoroscopic unit which um, I, I'm sorry, Rich, we have a CT fluoroscopic unit that is just dedicated to just doing this. So we are, we are really have a huge advantage, I realize. But, you know, uh, we just pushed to get it, and the hospital just basically gave it to us. So anyway, um, the things that, um, that, I, that I know now is that as we get more and more in depth of this, the more I know, the more I know that we don't know. Um, I'll talk about some off-label uses of things. Fibrin glue, which we use a ton of, actually is an off-label use in this particular application. So I'm gonna just talk about the advantages of how we do this, which is under CT fluoroscopic guidance, and then talk about patching versus surgery, and then future directions. So let's talk about what are the advantages of CT. It is a direct high-resolution imaging guidance accessible to, except for Rich, uh, the ex to uh, the majority of medical centers. Um, I think this will, my little thing, there we go. Uh, ability to identify spread of blood and mass effect, which I'm gonna show you. Ability to perform ventral and circumferential patches. And also, if you see a potential site of leak, which I'm gonna stress today, because you know there was the whole group that Rich talked about where you don't actually, the patient is negative, uh, they have negative leak, you know, negative for a leak, but they've got positive symptoms. So we actually will target places where we think there are potential sites of leak. So let's take a look at direct resolution imaging. Um, so this is how we do most of our patients. It's done under CT fluoroscopic guided imaging. Everything from the lumbar puncture to the, the lumbar, the myelogram to uh, directing the um, fibrin glue and blood patching. So we just localize the patient and here is what a CT fluoroscopic unit looks like. When we do our lumbar punctures, we use a 24 gauge Gertie Marks needle. Um, it, it has a, it's similar to a Whitaker, which I think a lot of people are familiar with, but the side hole is closer to the tip, which is one of the advantages. And so it's blunt tip side hole, so the chance of, first of all, contaminating your field when you're doing the myelogram is a lot less when you have a small needle. I've gotten sent images where they're done with a 22 gauge or a 20 gauge needle, and you see all of this contrast from the lumbar puncture site. You want to try and avoid that so you're not contaminating your own field with contrast in the epidural space that you actually created. This is what the CT fluoroscopic unit looks like. Um, you are right next to the patient doing either your lumbar puncture or your treatment or your myelogram, and you have a screen which actually has three images that are 0.8 millimeter thick slices. So essentially you're getting almost a 3D image, and there's your screen right there. And you take a picture every time by just stepping on a, on a foot pedal. So you, when you step on the foot pedal, you get a whole um, new series of images. So you can follow your needle um, all the way along as you're doing your procedure. 
We can do our regular myelogram when we do them decubitus. So we've gone to doing um, sometimes decubitus myelograms, left, right, and then prone. So we may get three myelograms. In, we can also do ultra-fast uh, myelograms, which Peter has already talked about. In this case, the patient actually had two calcified discs, tiny one here, larger one here, and we did an ultra-fast myelogram, which means scanning the patient forward, backward, forward, backward, four, in four different imaging sequences, and you do it over a site where you think there's the leak, and it actually turned out that the leak was coming, as we've seen other people report from the smaller disc, and here is the leak right there coming out ventrally, and so that contrast that is ventral to us right here is actually the contrast leaking from the hole, which is located right there. So uh, the other thing that we can do, because we're next to the patient, this was a 31-year-old who developed positional headaches, had him for about a year and a half. You can see that the floor of the third ventricle is down sloping, which is a sign, which uh, people have talked about. But she just had a funny-looking nerve root sleeve when we did her prone imaging. And we said, well, what the hell is up with that? And so we turned her in a decubitus position, and you could see that the contrast went out, this paraspinous vein, and it went into the azagous vein. So there was a CSF, you know, fistula, we could clearly see it, and then we could target that with a fibrin glue and blood patch. So we can target the patch right then and just put in a needle and put in fibrin glue and blood, and we're going to talk about it, but you can see how much mass effect that you're getting with that. We usually put in contrast first because you do not want to be in a vessel, and then we add um, the fibrin glue first because you want it adherent to the dura because it has more of a fibrous, a web that is more um, that's stickier and will stick to the uh, dura better than blood will, and then we follow it with blood. Now I have no data for this, but we found we started uh, using um, to seal, which is the product that we use. And um, we started using it in 2009, and it cut the number of repeat cases that we had to do in half when we started using to seal. But the patients didn't feel like they were getting entirely better, so we added blood behind that. And I'm not sure that you don't need platelets in addition to the fibrin glue in order to get a really good patch. I have not proved that, but uh, so if somebody could do that work, that would be super great. Um, so the types of patches that we can do, we can do anything. We can do everything from the cervical spine all the way down to wherever. Um, this is a patient who actually had a cervical leak. You can see coming out this nerve root right here. And we don't do these transforaminal like Bill showed, but we actually do them translaminar. Um, it's easier. It will go right out the nerve root sleeve regardless, and so you can do it pretty easily. And we... What has really informed all of the injections that we do is that in 2002, we started doing CT fluoroscopic guided pain management. And so we can put needles in along the spinal axis from really base of skull. And so we do, we've even done facet injections at the occipital condyle C1 or C12 facet injections all the way down. So we can put needles in lots of places where you might not want to go. Um, and when you do this, you can see the mass effect that you're getting on the thecal sac, and so you know that um, you're not getting too much mass effect, and yet you're covering the area, and the patient got better with this. Um, then we can do transforaminal. We can obviously do interlaminar, which is what most people are doing when they're talking about doing blood patching is interlaminar, or um, uh, I guess if you're snaking a catheter and you're putting that needle in interlaminar. And we can also do ventral patches. So if you look back here, this is actually a needle uh, where a patient had a leak, and you can actually put that needle ventral in the spinal canal right where the site of leak is located. So um, CT gives you really a ton of advantages. So you can identify the spread of blood and the mass effect that you're getting. And you can ne negotiate complicated anatomy. So here we had to negotiate the rib, the lung. We had to go underneath the transverse process in order to get to that transforaminal region. And we wanted to do a ventral patch here. So uh, here's the needle going into that space. And um, you, one thing we do is when we inject the contrast, you want to be sure it's not in a vessel. I just don't like to inject into vessels. I don't think it's the right thing to do at this point. 
And so if there's washout of contrast, then we're going we're gonna to find a spot where there's not washout of contrast, and you want to have this kind of mass effect right here, no washout of contrast, a nice collection, and we can see how much mass effect that we're actually getting on the thecal sac so that we don't cause too much mass effect. So in all the thousands of cases that we have done, we have never had to send a patient to surgery for any of the patches that we've ever done. Patients will have temporary pain along their nerve root, but all of that stuff ultimately resolves. Um, we can do ventral and circumferential patches, and this is pretty important because sometimes people will have lumbar punctures, they'll get a blood patch, and they don't get better. And sometimes that's because you have a really huge patient, like this person right here, and um, that patient, actually, when they did that lumbar puncture, they went all the way through the thecal sac. They went ventral into the epidural space. And so the reason why that patient did not get better with two blood patches is because the leak was ventral. And so all we had to do is go transforaminal and ventral, and we can get into that space and fill that, and that got rid of her, um, her post-LP headache. This was a patient who came down from the OB floor, and she came down totally obtunded after placement of an epidural catheter. And you can see right away that she has all the findings of intracranial hypotension. So she's got SAG, and she's got venous distension sign, and she's got diffuse dural enhancement. And intubated and obtunded, we just put a needle in, transforaminally and ventrally, and the contrast can go totally circumferentially, and two days later, her brain normalized, and she was out of the hospital with her baby. So that was pretty good. Um, the other thing is potential sites of leak can be targeted and can be accessed, and then you can assess the response. So this addresses Rich's category of people who have negative brains, negative spine imaging, and yet they have symptoms. And so when people are symptomatic with positional headaches, I always think about three things. It's either going to be high pressure, low pressure, or a cervicogenic cause. So I think about those things. But when it seems like it is a low pressure problem, we can like look at where we think a potential site of my leak might be. We can access it, patch it, and then we can assess the patient's response. Now, this patient doesn't have frontotemporal dementia. They were actually, I gave this talk to a group of people, and this was a technologist, um, actually, her father. And um, he had been in an Alzheimer's center for a year. He was cognitively impaired, speech difficulties, but he had no headache, left-sided tinnitus. And there's something called the Montreal Cognitive Testing, and it should normally be above 26, and his was 12. He has no brain sag, but he's got super subtle dural enhancement. You might have to put on your magical thinking glasses in order to see that. But at any rate, um, he had, we did a myelogram on him. His pressure was normal, but he had a calcified disc. Now, we know that calcified discs can penetrate the dura and cause a leak, but I bet it's also possible that a calcified disc can, like, rub the dura and cause an intermittent leak. So here is the calcified disc right here. All we did was patch him and patch him ventrally with fibrin glue and blood, and then he, we had him tested after that, and his uh, cognitive testing went from 12 to 22, and he's out of his Alzheimer's dementia thing. So, um, you know, we could be giving these talks across the country at Alzheimer's and dementia meetings because there's a lot of people who actually present with this problem and don't have headaches, but they may be cognitively impaired. Uh, this patient, uh, also uh, negative MR imaging, she'd had headaches for 25 years. In 2001, she had a motor vehicle accident. Her headaches changed to an occipital, and they became positional, nausea, vomiting, all these things you hear about. But what was really interesting about her is her blood pressure was incredibly erratic, and um, her pulse was erratic, and she developed hypoglycemia, and she was like a normal-sized person. She was seen at Mayo Clinic, a Michigan Headache and Neurologic. They'd done some, some blood patches that gave her temporary relief. 
Seven years later, she got to us. Her opening pressure was in the normal range, maybe a little bit low normal. And uh, we did a targeted blood patch, and she got some more temporary relief. We did it in the thoracic spine because after her MVA, she had like this circle from where she had actually hit the um, steering wheel. Well, um, she never, it never lasted, and she would always go back into these kind of chaotic blood pressure and pulses, um, and uh, she never really shifted into high pressure. So this is what she had. She had a super tiny disc at the C7-T1 level. Okay, now how am I going to, like, nobody's going to operate on that, right? But how can I confirm, well, maybe you would. <laughs> how can I confirm that maybe this is actually the problem? So I don't recommend that everybody try this at home, but we actually did a CTA, figured out where all the major, where the vertebral artery was, slid behind the vertebral artery, we went into the disc, and went right where that disc space was, injected contrast to confirm we were epidural, and then put in fiber and glue and blood, and she went into rebound high pressure. And so with that, we felt pretty good that this was likely the problem. She had a fusion there, and now her symptoms are all gone. So she doesn't have the hypoglycemia, blood pressure, pulse have all stabilized. Um, this 44-year-old um, came to us uh, from Michigan, and she had headaches for 15 years. Um, she rated her pain at 15 out of 10. Uh, she had really, brain looked super normal. And, you know, one of the reasons why I think that happens is maybe some people are actually high pressure presenting as low. Maybe fistulas, which we don't really know where they come from, are actually like a pop-off valve for somebody who actually has higher pressure. At any rate, she had two little funny-looking nerve root diverticuli. And the, there's nothing remarkable about these, but we patched them, and she got better for, she went into rebound high pressure for two weeks and then was better. But it wasn't sustained. And so actually we had those both operated on, and now she is headache free. So another potential site of leak, really didn't know if this was the problem, but when you patch it and the patient gets better, you have some credible evidence that maybe that's the problem. This 63-year-old uh, had already, you can see she's got sagging brain, dural enhancement, and she'd had three blood patches with no relief. But she has this potential side of leak. She's got a calcified disc. And so just like we see discs that can penetrate the dura and cause leaks, maybe hers is rubbing on the dura. So we did bilateral ventral patches right at that site. And here is her pre-imaging, and here is her post-imaging, and her symptoms completely resolved. Now, sometimes these things are going to require surgery, but we have actually had people where they didn't uh, require surgery. So now you're going to have to put on your magical thinking windows because that's what we had to use for this. Uh, this was a 25-year-old, and she'd had two motor vehicle accidents. She had blackout spells, lightheadedness, blurry vision, uh, POTS-like symptoms, and she was tr the midodrin helped a little bit. She had a patch in April of last year, which stabilized her symptoms, and she was able to return to work actually uh, for a couple of months, and then gradually her symptoms came back. There was nothing obvious on the myelogram, but if you change window and level, so we're changing positions, you know, we're going lateral to cubitus prone, but actually on CT, if you change your window and level on these, you can see some things sometimes that you would not otherwise see. So this is the typical myelogram window, but if you narrow that window to soft tissue, you will see something in the lateral recess that you didn't see before. And so when I targeted that area, she actually, her symptoms resolved. So is that like a subtle CSF veno fistula. My theory about uh, leaks in general is that there are going to be slow leaks, there are going to be fast leaks, there's going to be intermittent leaks. And so are we seeing some things that are actually just slow intermittent things and um, is this really just ventral epidural venous plexus where there is a leak into that? So patching versus uh, surgery. So what is our strategy for blood and or fibrin glue and surgery? 
So if we have a patient with no definite leak seen and uncertainty if the patient has SIH, we're going to do a non-targeted patch. And we may do like a high thoracic, low thoracic lumbar. Uh, we're not snaking catheters at all because um, we don't do that, but we would target it with CT fluoroscopic guidance. In the setting of a frank CSF leak, we're going to use fibrin glue plus blood, and we're going to use either non-targeted or targeted patch. If there's a calcified disc or a bony structure, we're going to attempt a targeted uh, fibrin glue and blood patch and then probably send the patient to surgery uh, if, it gets, um, if it comes back. I have had a patient who had a calcified disc and I didn't have to send them to surgery. If it's a cervical leak, these are generally just going to have to go to surgery because I really, even though I did that C7, T1 disc, I'm not doing that at higher levels yet. <laughs> Not even me. Uh, and then CSF venofistulas, you can attempt a targeted fibrin glue and blood patch or just send the patient to surgery. So I'm just going to show you a couple of patients. This is a 56-year-old who was sitting on her porch in the mountains of North Carolina, and she had a sudden onset of headache. Um, and she couldn't stand up. Uh, she had two blood patches. I wish I had included uh, this one so that I could have shown Charles. But anyway, she had two blind blood patches, and one of them actually went into the thecal sac. So she had, like, clumping of the nerve roots and stuff. Uh, but at any rate, she came. It was 12 days between the time when she was diagnosed and the time when she was treated, which is what we actually want. She has a totally normal-looking brain, so you know that even though people have normal-looking brains, they can still have leaks. And she has this big leak coming out ventrally, and it was due to a calcified disc, and we targeted it ventrally, and all of her symptoms went away, and I have not seen her. This 45-year-old patient, off and on positional headaches that would recur, and um, here he is normal, and then here he is with two months later with a big subdural and downward herniation, and he's got a big calcified uh, spur on behind that has actually caused a big leak. This is not going to be cured by anything that we do. We tried patching it, but it's going to need to have uh, repair. So future directions, I think we need better contrast agents to detect slower leaks and intermittent leaks. So somehow or another, we have to figure that out. So we have to find the unseen leak. Uh, better gluing agents to plug leaks. There is now Artis, which is actually a fibrin glue made by Baxter that sets up slower than the, the regular um, to seal. To seal sits, sets up in two seconds. This Artis actually sets up in two minutes, and it's not... Uh, frozen, well, it does come frozen, but you can thaw it. It lasts for a couple of weeks. It's super good. Um, so better gluing agents. Maybe we can keep some people out of the OR. Better devices to percutaneously plug leaks. We actually are developing a needle that will go ventrally in location, and it's a curved needle so that we can actually get across, and then from there we hope to go to something that will maybe take off discs, and then we can plug them and currently, we have a sham trial that's ongoing. Um, we have to look into targeted versus non-targeted patching, and then blood versus fibrin glue, and blood and fibrin glue, or fibrin glue alone. So with that, I'll end, and thank you very much.